Hello! Today I'm going to be talking about The Warlord Chronicles by Bernard Cornwell. I just have to do a video to gush about this trilogy because I loved it. And I won't go too in-depth in this video because I will be in a discussion with Alan over on his channel, The Library of Alexandria, along with Sarah from Sarah Reads and Theo Rekindled Reader. All three of these channels were very influential on me picking up this trilogy and I'm so glad I did especially Alan. Alan chanted Warlord at me pretty much any chance he got this last year, and it was well worth it because this trilogy was just everything I could want in an Arthur retelling and more. So let's get into it. First, a very brief overview, and I'm not going to go in depth about this setup because you'll get a lot of detail. You'll get enough detail when you read the series, but we are in Britain in the Dark Ages, and Britain's being attacked on various fronts, especially by the Saxons. And meanwhile, there's also religious conflict. So we have paganism established here. We have old gods and old magic, which involves things like druids and magic that has things like blood and bones and excrement and nasty stuff. Uh, and then we have the emergence of Christianity. And we see how this conflict gets woven into the plot as you move on in the trilogy. And so this added a lot of interesting things to, to the story and to the ways of life. So you have things like druids hopping on one leg before battle or, you know, the idea of whether you should burn bodies or not after people die, whether you can pray to certain gods or not, and whether that works or not. And of course, the role of prophecy, omens, and how magic works. Reading this perspective of people in the Dark Ages makes you really think about what these gods mean to these people when they are in war times, especially. So what magic means, what gods mean, and the need for heroes and good leaders and believing in people. And so those are important themes that kind of come out, I think, in this story. And this is all interesting because this is told in first person narration from the character Derval. Now, Derval is telling the story from the future. He's chronicling it. And when he's telling the story, he's an old man. He's a Christian monk. He's telling the story to the Queen of Powys, Igraine. And we're wondering, how did he end up here? Because he didn't start out as a Christian monk. And so we learn his story, how he comes to meet Arthur, how he becomes a warrior, how he knows Merlin. And so it's so fascinating to learn about all these familiar characters through Derval's perspective. And I say familiar, meaning if you're familiar with any Arthur retellings or if you're familiar with La Morte d'Arthur or any of those legends, then you will recognize names like Arthur and Guinevere and Lancelot and Mordred and Morgan and Merlin and uh, Gawain or Gawain, however you say that. If you're familiar with all those characters, then this will probably be fun just to get the flavor of humor, the way he sort of twist these characters in ways. But if you're not familiar with any of those characters at all, then I don't know that I would start here for an Arthur story. I might start with another source and come back to this, but you can't hear about this trilogy without hearing how amazing the characters are. And they were very reminiscent to me of Martin's characters in A Song of Ice and Fire, because many of them are, mm, they're not nice people, or they're very conflicted people, or they're very layered and you hate some of them and then you want to hate some of them but you can't quite hate some of them and you feel kind of just fascinated reading about them in any case this sort of leads into of course bernard cornwell's incredible writing style because the dialogue the banter the friendship the romance all of those things were just so well developed with the character dynamics but i i just was delighted with the character work and especially Derval. With Derval telling this story and not somebody like Merlin and Guinevere and Lancelot, you know, any of these other characters, it was an interesting choice for several reasons. So one is that I was questioning throughout the story, is magic real in this fictional world? What is the efficacy of magic? Are omens real? Is prophecy real? Are these weird rituals that they do, is it doing anything when they pray to gods? Are there actually gods that are listening and interacting? I'm not going to answer that question. I think it's a lot of fun if you go in just wondering as I did and then see if you get your questions answered. And related to that is the whole mystique about heroes because Derval is telling the story to Igraine and she's learned certain legends of Arthur and Lancelot and things like that through songs. Songs play a big role in sort of building up the mystique of the hero. And when Derval's telling the story, 
and we get the impression he's trying to be very, very authentic. Of course, that's always questionable when you're in first person narration, but he does in some way sort of demystify the Arthur legend by making Arthur out to be a bit more human than others would expect. And at the same time, he sort of builds the mystique in subtle ways. So this is the amazing thing. So with Dervil, there's so much I want to say about him. In first person narration, again, telling the story from the future, wondering how he ended up where he ended up. When I first read about Dervil in book one, I was thinking, oh, that's a really interesting choice. A side character telling the story of Merlin and Arthur and all these characters that I know about, um, rather than the story being told from Arthur's perspective or Merlin's perspective. As I read on in the trilogy, I grew more and more attached to Dervil to the point where his hate became my hate. His love became my love. His passion became my passion. Whenever he would become sentimental and reflect on things, I just felt it. I felt his blood, sweat, and tears in battle. I felt the weight of his armor. I felt his desire for glory. I just felt all of it. The huge range of emotions that Dervil has, it's a slow build throughout the trilogy. And I think the reason it works is because he built my trust in the beginning by sort of painting himself to be a side character. He put much more focus on these other characters that we're more familiar with. He did bring some attention to himself, but he sort of saw himself. It seems like he saw himself as sort of a side character in this sort of story. And then little by little, you see him strengthen and strengthen and grow and just evolve as a character. And I think because that was a slow start for me, I think it won me over, it won my trust. Now, when it comes to first person narration, I think we've seen it done a couple of different ways. I think we've seen it done with like Fitz from Farseer Trilogy, where you have a character telling their story, but this is a person who has obviously gone through a lot of difficulty in his youth. And he is kind of the center of the story at first, at least. And maybe that opens up to something more as you read on in Farseer. And then you have characters like both in the name of the wind and he does have a lot of special abilities and uh, Darrow from Red Rising also has a lot of special abilities but with Dervil he does start out quite simple and not very clever as Merlin likes to point out and I think that made him very endearing to me personally and it just made me trust him as I went on in the story despite myself because I tried not to trust him I thought mm, first person narration he might not be telling the whole truth but I just, I found myself falling in love with Dervil. And I think this speaks to Bernard Cornwell's incredible writing style again, because he wrote Dervil's character in such a convincing way that it's made me curious to read other books by Bernard Cornwell and see if his authorial voice is as strong as it was for Dervil in my experience, because wow, I was convinced. I just adored him. While I'm on the subject of writing style, I'll just go ahead and say I thought that the prose was fantastic personally. It felt authentic to that time. At the same time, it flowed beautifully. It didn't feel dense or archaic. It was just perfect. It, it flowed so well. Related to writing style again is the way he used foreshadowing to great effect in this trilogy. So there were three different ways I kind of noticed this, if they can all be considered foreshadowing, I'm not sure. But one is that Dervil would just straight out say something like, and then there was the day that this happened. And then he'd kind of fill in what happened and how it happened. Another way is that uh, certain characters might make certain statements that involve themes. I don't want to say too much about what those are, but it reminded me a lot of, uh, of Abercrombie's writing style in that way, where he'll kind of repeat a statement over and over again related to a theme, and he then shows you how that works, and he will show you. And then the other way is through dialogue. There might be hints of something in that saying, where there's smoke, there's fire, where there's smoke, there's fire in this trilogy, and he delivers. He delivers it every way that your imagination wants it to be delivered. So for me, that was very effective. I loved his use of foreshadowing in this trilogy. And then the other thing too are the battle scenes. The battle scenes were just phenomenal. It is called The Warlord Chronicles. I do think you have to appreciate battle to enjoy this trilogy. And while they aren't magical in like a fantasy battle, they do incorporate a lot of tactics and strategy and consideration of terrain, number of men, resources, armor, all those things get considered. And I felt it. I felt the energy of the battle. I felt like there was a fantastic ebb and flow of energy 
that is created through his battle scenes. They were just brilliant. They were amazing. Now, as for the reading experience, I listened to this on audiobook and used ebooks as well. So I know not everybody prefers that method and some people don't like audiobooks, but I will say that I know many people who love this trilogy, who read them visually and just adored the trilogy. So I don't think it's a necessity to listen to the audiobooks, but if you enjoy audiobooks, then Jonathan Keeble's narration is phenomenal. He brought the character of Derval to life so well. He did all the character voices in a fantastic way. It was one of my favorite audiobook productions I've ever listened to, so I definitely think you're in for a treat if you love audiobooks. It did help me personally to have the ebook handy as well, especially in book one. So this is going into the overall reading experience. So book one, you are given quite a bit of exposition. You're given a lot of character names and places. I think that can slow down the pacing a little bit for book one because you are trying to get oriented and not really as focused with the plot, though there are some very important events that happen in book one and a very exciting climax at the end of book one. But in book two, I think that the story becomes much more focused. And then book three, you see beautiful echoes all the way back to book one, but it also is very exciting as well. And I, I just, like I said, I think it's a build that just keeps getting better and better as you read on. But it does remind me a lot of Abercrombie's First Law Trilogy in that way, because I've often told people with the First Law Trilogy, if you loved Joe Abercrombie's writing style and his humor and his characters in The Blade itself, but you thought the plot didn't quite deliver what you were wanting, keep going because it will come together and it will become more focused as you read on. I would say the same is true in Warlord Chronicles. So I felt as though there, like I said, there were some important things that happened in book one, but it did feel a little unfocused plot-wise for a while or just with what was happening. It didn't feel as focused with what's happening until maybe the end. And then in book two, you start to see again how things that happened in book one really have effect that keeps going and it builds and builds. And as I've said before, I think this is somewhat reminiscent of A Song of Ice and Fire by George R.R. R. Martin. With the character work and the humor and the tone, it just reminded me of Martin in that way. It has been a while since I read A Song of Ice and Fire. I'm going to be rereading it next year. But I did think of that series a lot while I was reading it. Of course, this is in first person. It's a much more contained story um, as far as locations are concerned. And, you know, you don't quite get dragons or things like that. But... It is absolutely, I think, very similar in tone, like I said, but I really do think that fans of A Song of Ice and Fire might really love this trilogy. It's just my hunch. And as for themes, fate is a big one. Fate is inexorable is a common statement by Merlin. The weight of oaths. Oaths have a huge significance in this particular trilogy and how oath precedes law and uh, leadership is explored in an interesting way in this trilogy as well. And what does it mean when somebody doesn't want a leadership role and when they do want it? And of course, you also have different politicking people who are, you know, using religion for power and gain as much as people are wanting religion and gods and magic to give them some hope in the world. So you see a full spectrum as far as that's concerned. I think that the politics were kind of cool in this trilogy, but I also think that this trilogy, especially with all the battle scenes and everything happening there, just has a lot of themes that fantasy lovers usually tend to gravitate towards. So truth and courage and valor, all of those types of, of themes. Um, there is some romantic love, and I loved, by the way, song, the way that bards would use songs <laughs> and how that affected history. So I just thought that was fantastic to see how that played a role in this trilogy. Uh, but there's a lot. There's a lot there. There are a lot of wonderful things to talk about with this trilogy. So I hope you join us on that live show over on Alan's channel. I think we are going to start spoiler free, and uh, that's about it for now. So please let me know in the comment section below if you plan to read this trilogy or if you've read it. I'd love to hear from you. And thank you so much for watching. Have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.